How's it going? Hi. Hi, Annabelle. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing okay, actually, surprisingly well. Um, I'm pretty happy about the convention. Um, there were things that I wish that had been done differently, but I do feel energy after watching it. I feel mm -hmm. focused. I feel like um, they made a strong case for the ticket. So it did all the things that I think it needed to do. I just wish that there were some other things that happened, but you know, but but I am I am kind of a diehard progressive. But <laughs> you, you are. Um, and let, let me just address that because I read your post. <clears throat> First of all, we have over two months to communicate all of those other things. And the other thing is. People need to understand that Joe Biden can say, oh, well, we're going to do Medicare for all. We're going to do a Green New Deal. We're going to do free college for all. We're going to do all of these incredible things. And nothing of that is going to get done unless we flip the Senate and not only flip the Senate, but convince our Democratic senators that they need to get rid of the filibuster. So that's a whole nother conversation. But we are, as Michael Moore talked about in his recent piece, we are in an impending catastrophe that makes any discussion about progressive policy agenda items almost irrelevant. Yeah, I agree with it. Um, I Look, I made that post about things I didn't like about the convention. Namely, that um, I just didn't think um, they had any big ideas that we could use to feel optimistic. You know, they made a case that Biden is a decent guy, that Kamala Harris is a compelling person. But I, in order for me to have hope, I want to know that there are real ideas and, and solutions. And so that's right, kind I of my beef with the, com with the convention. But... Uh, I'm not dwelling on it. I just, I do want the Democrats to really start talking about solutions as opposed to just being very focused on not being Trump. Can, can so I tell you why that, can I, yeah. can I tell you why that's not gonna happen? Um, you can, sure. Not gonna right. change my opinion, but go ahead. Well, I've known you long enough to know that that is absolutely true, Annabelle, um, but I, I think we need to factor this in. This election is not about progressive ideas. It's not about big ideas. It's about literally saving the country from fascism, authoritarianism, and the devastation of every one of our democratic institutions. After four years from now, when we can <clears throat> right the ship and get it stable under what many people consider to be boring Joe Biden, then we can have that conversation. <clears throat> but right now, we are in the ICU of democracy, and we don't really, we shouldn't, in my opinion, be spending time talking about whether we want strawberry or vanilla or chocolate chip ice cream when we, when we recover, right? So that's my strong view. But the more important point is the Democratic Party, as much as you may hate them, they have done extensive polling and they do not want to distract from what they believe is a winning issue, which is that Donald Trump is completely incompetent. He screwed up coronavirus. He's a threat to you and your racial relations in your cities, et cetera, et cetera. Not to transition the conversation in these critical last months about the merits of the Green New Deal or Medicare for all, okay? And, and the polling on that is overwhelmingly in favor of the democratic strategy, as much as whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason that everybody is doing that, uh, Michael Moore talks in his piece about five things that are a disaster. I wanna just read through the 12 ways that Donald Trump can win, right? We have to focus on this. This is a defense election, not an offense election. And, um, so I spoke to Michael Steele, the former head of the RNC yesterday, long conversation. And he said, there is a 50-50 chance that Donald Trump will win this election. I think it could be more than that. And I predicted that he could win in 2016. Let me go through my list. 
He's going to weaponize the post office. I want to talk more about it. There will be a coronavirus October surprise. And in fact, right now, he's actually doing one on that, which is he is um, about to announce in 13 minutes, he's about to announce a new uh, plasma uh, uh, therapeutic cure, which is going to make him look good and have people not worry about coronavirus, which will allow him to be seen as this this great leader. They will purge the voter rolls in swing states. We know that for, a, for an absolute case. Number four, sycophantic Republican state legislators will override the will of the people in states like Florida and perhaps Georgia, Arizona, other states, and will choose their own slate of electors, which they are allowed to do under the United States Constitution. Number five, sycophantic Republican state governors can choose the electors. It's a little complicated, but they can in certain circumstances. Number six, there could be faithless electors. The Supreme Court did not outlaw faithless electors. That's a misconception. Number seven has an A and a B, outright old fashioned cheating in vote counting and electronic voting machine flipping. All of the voting machine companies are run by Republicans. Uh, number eight, Russia and Trump, social media disinformation and gaslighting. Number nine, the Mike Pence strategy. Under the constitution, the vice president certifies the election. What if Mike Pence doesn't? Um, number 10, this is very serious. 26 Republican states in the United States House, if neither of the candidates gets 270 electoral votes, it goes to the House. Right now, Donald Trump would be reelected unless we flip at least three more seats in the House of Representatives. Happy to talk to you about that. Number 11, John Roberts. I think ultimately, under a lot of scenarios, this is going to go into the Supreme Court to ultimately decide like they did in 2000. It's going to be up to John Roberts. And number 12, and this applies to a lot of people who are watching you, Annabelle, and love you as I do, it, this election could be won by Donald Trump because of young people primarily who just can't vote for Joe Biden because he's not progressive enough, he's too old, he's too much of a corporate Democrat, he's too much whatever. That alone, that alone, not to mention the, the other 11 things, that alone could absolutely reelect Donald Trump, okay? So that's my thing. You want to talk about any of those? I'm happy to drill down, put a lot of work into that. I've been talking to a lot of experts. There are 12 separate ways, and the post office is just one of them, that we can lose this election to Donald Trump. OK. Um, can you do this for me? Can you, can you just kind of spell out okay, what you think is likely to happen, in your opinion? What do you think is likely to happen based on what you just said? Well, here's the most like, here's, listen, I think all of those scenarios are, they go from somewhat likely to extremely likely, right? All 12 of them, right? But let me tell you the one that we've been focused on. And I did a Facebook post that got a huge amount of traction um, last week sitting in front of the United States Post Office um, here in Los Angeles. And this, I think, is really, really, really real. So I'm going to start off by saying the following words. We can't vote by mail. We cannot vote by mail. This is his number one most likely strategy. Because here's what happens. Even if Louis DeJoy decides to be an American citizen instead of a Trumpian, um, and all of the mail-in ballots get delivered on time, even if every single one gets delivered on time and they're not destroyed, they're not lost, there are plenty of post boxes to put them in, et cetera. Even if every single piece of mail, mail-in ballots, absentee ballots, are delivered by the United States Post Office on time, Donald Trump is going to use this scenario to win the election. Here's how it happens. Donald Trump's voters are overwhelmingly, like 80%, going to vote in person because Donald Trump has told them that the mail is screwed up and they don't want to do that. And he has said it's safe, it's patriotic, it's the right thing to do to vote by, in person. And they don't believe in the coronavirus as a deadly thing. I mean, look what happened in South Dakota, 
right? So you combine all of those things, plus the statistics are telling us that Donald Trump supporters will vote in person. Democrats have been told, we've been led, led into a trap. We've been told that we should vote by mail, right? That that's the, it's fine, vote early, vote by mail, it, save yourself from being at risk, et cetera, especially if you're older or whatever, right? So for weeks, we've been playing into Donald Trump's trap, right? Because here's what happens. If in fact, um, it's true that Joe Biden people vote very in very small numbers in person, and Donald Trump supporters vote in very large numbers in person, which is likely what's gonna happen unless we change this conversation immediately. At, on election night at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and even all of the exit polls are going to show that Donald Trump has not only won in the swing states, but he has won by a landslide. It'll be like 65, 35 or 70, 30 because the Democratic votes will not have been counted yet because they're coming in by mail. They'll be counted and under in some states, they're not even allowed to be counted until the election is over, which is like eight o'clock, right? But all of those other votes will be counted beforehand. And what about the ballots that come the next day, the following day after that, the following day after that? So Donald Trump will have that evening to literally give an acceptance speech and declare victory. Then the next day, he's still ahead. Then the next day, he's probably still ahead. And just like Bill Barr did with the Mueller report, once you get out in front and you cement that spin that you have won, especially since he's been, pre been preparing this talking point for months now, that the Democrats are going to try to steal the election by using the mail, when that in fact happens, that the Democratic votes come in later, Donald Trump is going to say, I promise you this will happen unless we vote in person or hand in our ballots literally at the, the polling station or directly to the uh, registrar recorder. He's going to say, I've won. The Democrats are trying to cheat. Everyone get out into the streets and protest. They're trying to steal the election from your president. They're trying, they can't accept defeat. They're trying to steal the election, right? So ultimately that has no legal effect, but it has a massive public relations effect. And it will be very connected in my opinion to a lot of violence. And so that when this case goes through the courts and it goes up to the United States Supreme Court and you have 40% of the country about to go into a, with guns, about to go into a, an extended period of revolt and civil war if John Roberts flips that decision because Trump has so whipped up his crazy ass base. I know John Robert, Roberts. I actually had dinner with him years ago. He's a very decent man, but he's a very no drama Obama kind of justice. And he's gonna look at, okay, the law says I can go either way on this. If I go for the Democrats, we have civil war. If I go with the Republicans, Democrats are pacifists. They're gonna march in the street for a few days, but nothing's gonna happen. That is what I, I would say that it has more than a 70% chance of happening. So that alone. Okay. Mm -hmm. and okay, so you're making a persuasive case. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, so. Yeah, I, I think that's a you're making a persuasive case there, and that's very compelling. I just want to ask you though, before everyone has a panic attack watching this, because I don't want people to panic. I do. Can, I want you, them to panic. Okay. Well, can we talk about what we can do to get ahead of yeah. this? Okay. Yeah. Well, there as I mentioned, do not vote by mail. Do not vote by mail. Right now, you can request your absentee ballot, your mail-in ballot, by mail. That's fine, and do it now. Let's get those things in your hands. And then at the first opportunity, I want you to either hand those in to the registrar recorder's office or to a designated drop box that is not the United States Post Office, or to just save it and go down to the polls when there is 
live early voting, right? And do that early, bring that in, or vote in person, wear a double mask, um, do whatever you need to do, but you cannot use the mail, right? So that will diminish, if not take away, the Donald Trump public relations strategy that the Democrats are stealing the election. So that's, I think, the most important thing. The second most important thing is to have a serious conversation with the 100 million American citizens that will not vote. Every, everyone says to me, oh, Democrats are fired up. Young people are fired up. No, 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 no. Young people don't vote. And then when you add to that, young people who are civically engaged, who are Bernie or Elizabeth Warren supporters and are progressives, who are gonna sit this out because it's the fuck you to the Democratic Party and to Joe Biden, that also will almost ensure that we lose. So I would spend between now and election day, and remember, everyone who's not gonna vote will have not voted all the way through till eight o'clock on election day, and actually send them, and I, I don't wanna put a plug for my piece, but I put a lot of time into putting forth some very logical reasons. It's entitled, and we'll put the link, and I think you may have already shared it, Annabelle, called RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and 29 other reasons to vote for Joe Biden, parentheses, even if you hate him. So if we can have that conversation starting now, understanding that this is not about the Green New Deal, it's not about Medicare for all, it's about literally saving America from fascism and authoritarianism and the destruction of every single democratic institution. And as Michael Moore says, and I couldn't agree with him more on this, destroying, destroying the Republican Party. They've had their chance over and over and over again to redeem themselves. And they had another chance yesterday. Nancy Pelosi put forth a $25 billion bill to save the post office because they're in so much trouble, not for voting necessarily, but so that veterans can get their medications, so people can get their checks and people can get their, their birthday cards and whatever. And so many communities rely, as you know, on the mail, on the US Postal Service. Every single Democrat, and you say, oh, the Democrats suck. They're not, they and the Republicans, they're all part of this corporate elite bullshit. It's bullshit, I'm sorry, it's not true. It's not true. The Democratic Party, every single one of the Democrats in the House of Representatives yesterday voted to give $25 billion in emergency funds to the United States Post Office. Only 26 of the Republicans, and there are about 170, 165, 170 who voted against, only 26 agreed with the Democrats. And not only that, it's now gonna go to the Senate and the Republican Senate is not gonna even pick it up. So if you think there is no difference in your voting between Republicans and Democrats, you're not accurate on that. So we have to get rid of the Republican Party at every level. That means we have to flip the Senate. There, Annabelle, do you know how many Republican senators are up for re-election in this, in this election on November 3? Um, I forget. I know we need four, but uh, how many? Right, right. There are 23. 23, okay. There are 23 Republican Senate seats that can be flipped. 23. Mm -hmm. Now, we need four to go from 47 to 51, right? Or three mm -hmm. plus the vice president. But let's, let's focus on four. But there's 19 others. If we got 13 of the 23, right, as a net gain, right? Mm -hmm. And I know Doug Jones is a little tricky. We would have 60, which means we wouldn't even have to nuke the filibuster. We would have a supermajority so that we could pass the Green New Deal and we could pass free college for all. We could pass Medicare for all if we were able to do that as a party. We, there would be mm -hmm. no Republicans, uh, no Republican ability to stop us. So number one, uh, don't vote by mail. Number two, Let's destroy the Republicans and especially focus on flipping the Senate and getting rid of as many of the 23 Donald Trump enablers as we can. And also let's, let's enhance our majority in the United States House. Let's vote in more Democratic governors 
and let's flip a bunch of state legislatures so that especially we can get rid of the electoral college. We are three states away from having the national popular vote interstate compact become the law of the land and have a national popular vote determine our president in 2024. Most people don't know that. So Democrats at the state level, Democrats at the, the House and the Senate level, and of course, flipping the White House. So Melania can't do any more damage to the Rose Garden. <laughs> Um, let me ask you a very, very procedural question. Okay. Let's assume we're going to have um, recounts. Let's say we have recounts in Florida, in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. Okay, I'm question like who actually does the recounting? Who physically does the recounting? Right. Well, every state has different laws about the procedures and the timing and all of that, but generally it is the same people that did the count in the first place, which would be the registrar of voters. However, there will be massive legal challenges as to which ballots are in fact going to allow, be allowed to be counted. For example, let's say that the law in Florida, I don't know specifically, let's say the law in Florida is that the ballots must uh, arrive um, by eight o'clock on election night, okay? And let's say there is a screw up with the mail and some of the ballots don't arrive until 8.15 or they don't arrive until first thing the next morning. Ron DeSantis and the Republican state legislature in Florida would be going to court demanding that those ballots not be counted as citing Florida law, right? The Democrats would be going to court saying, no, it was a mistake of the, the Republican, Republican run US Postal Service or it was fraud by the Postal Service. That then goes to court. Then the local court decides and then it gets appealed and then it gets appealed and then it gets appealed. I mean, it's going to be a monster legal um, nightmare at every level. But to answer your specific question, it is generally going to be the county registrar of voters, county recorder, whatever it is in that particular state. Now, are these votes going to be counted accurately? I don't know. I mean, look what happened in 2000, right? Are they, is the voting counting going to get stopped in some way? Right. It, it all comes back to the same thing, which is we have to have a massive landslide. And I want you to be particularly concerned about the exit polling. Right. So we're not going to have official results more than a few percent on election night if there are a lot of mail in ballots. But the the exit polling, they're going to be there are people from NBC, ABC, CBS, everything going to be outside these polling stations in the key swing states saying, you know, who did you vote for, right? But if only, again, repeating what I was saying in the beginning, if only Trump voters are at the polls, the exit polls are going, the official exit polls are gonna be convincing people that Donald Trump won. So again, this is gonna be a disaster. It's, I don't see, in fact, you may know about this, Michael Steele and a bunch of other people participated in a, in a war gaming scenario. Yeah where they went mm -hmm. through all of these different scenarios and every single one ended in a calamitous disaster. So we need yeah. to be prepared for it. Michael Moore is right. We need to be prepared. This is gonna be war, a civil war, unlike we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm put dropping in a bunch of links to these things that we're referencing. Um, I wanted to ask you about the thing that kept me up a couple of nights, which is, hearing that Republicans are recruiting 50,000 poll workers and monitors. They have $20 million to do this. I don't know if we are recruiting at that scale. I know there are efforts, like I just dropped a link to power the polls, um, but that worries me because I've seen like true the vote, like Tea Party types showing up at polling stations to engage in voter intimidation. Right. So especially in the South, that right. is very intimidating and that will get 
a lot of immigrant voters, naturalized citizens to avoid the polls. They feel like they might get harassed. Well, right? and, and, and Trump, so- Trump, um, Go ahead. Yeah, so that's another thing I just wanna throw in there, like these so-called poll workers, the monitors that the Republicans are recruiting. Um, I, 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 just, I just fear what they're actually gonna do, what the plan is, what their battle plan is for election day. Well, I think it's pretty transparent. By the way, um, Trump has floated the idea of having, you know, police officers or sheriffs or the military at the polling stations, which goes back to the days of George Wallace in Alabama and, and massive voter intimidation. And yes, I mean, if you have a heavy police presence, there are going to be a lot of people who are not going to want to show up, right? So, but that is likely unconstitutional, and I think he will not win on that. Is he going to be able to have people who are paid operatives of the Republican Party standing there with some official looking whatever or intimidating people just by their presence? You can count on that. And I don't know if we're doing the opposite of that. Again, right. I, I hate to be pessimist. I am, I am really an optimist, but I don't see a way for this to go smoothly. And, and, and I think the most important thing we can do again, is to get that 100 million people that won't vote, most of whom would vote Democratic, to actually vote and to not look at Joe Biden, right? You're not voting for Joe Biden. That's part of it. You're voting for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Do you want Donald Trump or Joe Biden picking Ruth Bader Ginsburg's replacement? Joe Biden has already said he's going to appoint an, an African-American woman or a woman of color to the United States Supreme Court, which would be the first time ever, well, certainly an African-American. You're voting for someone other than William Barr to be attorney general. You're voting to undo all of the environmental things that Donald Trump has done to destroy our environment over the past four years. You're voting for a, a new secretary of state that's not Mike Pompeo, on and on and on, right? So I, I beg people, to work on their family members and friends who are just too hip and too woke and too cool and too progressive to vote for Joe Biden. It's, it, it really doesn't show how woke you are. It shows how, how actually uneducated you are about what really is going on in this election. Mm. Anyway, go mm. ahead, I'm sorry. Well, no, it's okay. I mean, I think the where I disagree slightly with you is you know, you know, I travel a lot to battleground states and I talk to voters. I try to find the people who are in that hundred million category right. of people who don't show up. And what I have found is they are in communities where nothing really changes. You know, they, the manufacturing is gone and they really haven't had jobs. Um, and right. the, the jobs didn't magically appear um, with George Bush or with Obama. Or, or with Trump. So just, they right. just feel like it doesn't matter. They just become very cynical about politics. And so with all these barriers to voting and with all this noise, they might just again say, I, I don't want to bother. It doesn't matter. Let me, Those let are the people I'm worried about. Answer. I, let, okay. Can I give a direct answer to that? First of all, uh, the Republican party does not care about basic working class jobs or working class people. They simply don't. They say they do, but they don't because every single time they have a chance to vote on where to put money, they give it to big corporations, not to working class people. Secondly, Barack Obama desperately wanted to create new, for example, renewable energy, clean economy jobs. And he was blocked by Republicans and Mitch McConnell with the filibuster. Thirdly, I promise you, you people who hate Joe Biden, you people who need jobs, uh, Joe Biden understands the power of job creation, and he's talked about it a lot, of creating a clean, green, renewable energy infrastructure. There are more new jobs coming from solar and wind and other renewable energy sources than anything else. And if we can multiply that five or 10x Almost everybody who has lost a manufacturing job will be able to get a job in creating a clean, green, renewable energy infrastructure that will ultimately make money for decades to come. It's the clearest, 
most obvious way to create jobs and to also fight climate change. And Joe Biden understands this. I promise you he does. And he's going to implement that if he has a Democratic Senate who will not allow a filibuster to happen on those clean energy, uh, renewable energy jobs. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's believable, Richard. What I'm trying to tell you is that my analysis of the 100 million voters who don't vote is not the too woke for school people. It's not people who just are, are Bernie bros. Um, I'm sure they're, they're in there, but right. the ones that consistently don't show up when they should are people who have totally checked out. Like politics has nothing to do with them. You know, and I've right. been in communities like that that are just dying, that are decaying, and there's just no evidence that there's been really any investment or leadership in those communities. And so that's kind of what I'm talking about. Those are the people I worry about, and I that's why I feel like there needs to be engagement from the Democratic Party at that level. How so, can I get get jobs for these folks immediately? So Annabelle, is it your belief mm -hmm. that, and I understand mm -hmm. that the too woke for school Bernie bros, it's a small percentage, but it could be enough to flip an election. But I agree with you, the vast majority of the 100 million that won't vote are people who are just disengaged. They're frustrated, they're disgusted, all of that. Is it your belief that jobs is the, is the number one reason that the vast majority of these 100 million people don't vote? Because I don't agree. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily captured in jobs, but it's about material conditions of their lives, right? Okay. So people who's, who live in communities where the hospitals have closed, where the jobs have gone overseas, you know, where right. the, the fishing towns where there's very little fishing being done, and, and there's a brain drain from those communities to cities. And, and so it's, it's really just about, not just about jobs, but about a whole way of life, like what's happened to those communities. They're dying or dead. Right, so, so I have a couple of responses to that. One is, because by the way, if you're saying that it's all about jobs, there are not 100 million people that don't have jobs that are trying to find jobs. But if you're talking oh. about this malaise and this, this lifestyle, the standard of living that people see, you know, dropping every single year in certain cities and regions. I, I agree. And listen, I mean, it's even in Los Angeles. Yeah. We have more homeless people here in LA than I've ever seen in my life, right? So there, I think a couple of things. One is we have to look at how much can a federal government fix that, right? Because there's also state governments and county governments and city governments. And there are certain things that simply are not easy to fix, right? So if you're going to blame the federal government for everything that's going wrong in your community, that's not exactly accurate. And I have to no. repeat what I said. The Democrats have a philosophy of focusing on working people. The Republicans' philosophy is trickle down. It's not changed since Ronald Reagan. Let's give as much money and tax breaks to big yeah. corporations, and let's also allow them to get their products made in China or Vietnam or Laos, right? So I think there is a huge difference between Democrats and Republicans in general. But the point is, we're not going to convince everybody that voting is going to fix their life and make them happy again. We're not. But I want to run through a couple quick things that people may not know about Annabelle, which um, I think are not insignificant. They may not relate to whether you can put food on the table or whether it is safe necessarily for you to walk outside because there's so much crime or whatever. But for example, um, HR 6 is the DREAM Act. And so for those people who are dreamers, if you elect a, more Democrats to the Senate and Joe Biden to the presidency, HR 6 will become the law of the land and you will never, ever, ever have to be afraid of being kicked out of the country if you are a dreamer. I think that's significant. HR 7 is the Paycheck Fairness Act, passed the House of Representatives as, as did the DREAM Act, and it has been blocked by a Republican Senate. If you elect four more people, three more senators, that are Democrats and a, a president who's a Democrat, 
H.R. 7, the Paycheck Fairness Act, guaranteeing, legally guaranteeing equal pay for women who are making 81 cents on the dollar will become the law of the land. And there's so many other things that apply, right? We've got the Climate Action Now Act will pass if we do it. We'll, we can change our democracy and end gerrymandering and get a lot of money out of politics with HR1. With HR3, we can get lower prescription drug prices like they have in Canada. HR4, the voting, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act, that can pass. HR5, if you are a, a, a LGBTQ person, you do not have equal rights yet. You can get married, but you still don't have equal rights. The House unanimously by Democrats passed the Equality Act sponsored by my friend David Cicilline, right? One of two openly gay members of Congress. There are a lot of gay people who don't have equal rights. That has a big impact on their quality of life. Um, that bill will 100% pass the United States Senate with three more Democratic senators and a Democratic vice president to break the tie. And Joe Biden will sign it within 20 minutes of its passage. So there are things that can be done. They may not affect someone's job or, or, or intimately the quality of their life in some ways, but it will in many other ways. And one last thing, HR, HR 8, the bipartisan background checks bill unanimously passed by Democrats in the House of Representatives, blocked by Mitch McConnell and Republicans in the Senate. That will guarantee that no guns can be sold in the United States of America without certain very intense and, and I think appropriate background checks. That will make a difference in the quality of our lives for especially for kids who are in schools who are, are scared to death every day. Right? It won't stop gun violence, but it will be a step in the right direction. So we can make a lot of incremental changes and some transformational changes by voting in this election, even though magically perhaps jobs and your economy is not gonna to return to your region. Does that help at all? Or am I, am I just being an elitist who doesn't care about the things that these 100 million people that you're talking to care about? Well, I guess the way I think about it is, and, and again, even though I'm all for progressive policies, but the way we talk about issues to me is, doesn't fit with how these 100 million people think about it. I think they think about their communities, like what is around them, okay? And whether or not their lives are better. Is my life better off four years later after Trump got elected? Was it, was my, did my life improve under Obama, right? It's very general. Right. And just to give you an example, you know, hun, over 170 hospital, rural hospitals have closed since 2005. And um, that means jobs have been lost. That means you don't have access to hospitals when you need it. That means if you're in rural areas, you get into a car accident, it's excruciatingly painful because you're waiting for a helicopter that may or may not come, depending on weather, okay? Right. And so, yeah, so there are just these ways in which like people's lives are made really difficult when we don't have a way to like support rural hospitals. We don't have a way of giving people more access to not just jobs yeah you can get a job at walmart you can get a job working at amazon warehouse okay or being a whatever uber driver but in order for you to have jobs that actually pay your bills that give you benefits those jobs are actually very hard to come by okay right. so we're not just talking about any job we're talking about good jobs with benefits that give people the capacity to own a home and take care of their children, okay? Well, so that's why- we, Annabelle, yeah, we, Annabelle yeah. there's this thing that we had in America from yeah. decades ago to absolutely yeah. deal with every single thing that you're talking about. It's called okay. unions, right? Yeah. And, and only one party actually yeah. supports the union movement and that is the Democratic Party. And if you're absolutely. talking about rural hospitals, I guarantee you, I can get back to you on it. I guarantee you that there are many pieces of legislation that have been introduced 
by Democrats and maybe even some in the, in, by Republicans to benefit rural hospitals, just like the bill, the, the, the bill that was passed in the House yesterday about, for the US Post Office is, is overwhelmingly for rural areas that rely overwhelmingly disproportionately on US Postal Service for their very economy and their lifeblood of medicine and payments and all of that. And only Democrats are supporting that. So I wanna suggest one thing as a summary. The Democratic, okay. Party, the Democratic Party is not perfect. Joe Biden is not perfect. No politician is perfect. But mm -hmm. I've been in politics literally for 50 years. I've run mm -hmm. for Congress. I've, I've worked in Congress. I know many, many, many members of Congress, and I am telling you from the bottom of my heart that there is a massive, massive difference on every level between the policies, yeah. the values, yeah. the philosophies, the humanity of the Democrats and the Democratic Party than the Republicans mm -hmm. and the Republican Party. I, I agree perfect, with you. But if, I, if people I just agree with got, you. let me just finish. So all I'm uh -huh. saying is I guarantee you that if you're one of those 100 million people and you think that your life sucks for one reason or another, that there is a very strong chance that by electing more Democrats, it will get better. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Okay. I'm not disagreeing with you. I think there, I am not a false equivalency person. I completely agree with you. I'm just trying to explain to you where some of the hundred million people that don't I, vote are I, coming I, from, I, okay? I get and it. how do we reach them? I'm interested in reaching them. So I made the post that said some criticisms about the Democratic Party convention in part because I'm trying to help the Democrats reach those hundred million people because I know many of them. Okay, I spent a lot of time talking to them, right? And going over bills that failed to pass is not is going to fall on deaf ears. Okay, in order to get them, we have to we have to have an understanding and a lot of empathy for why they feel the way they feel. Like, why do they feel so cynical? Why have they given up? Why don't they vote? And so, instead of talking to them like they're idiots. Okay, we have to kind of try to see things from their perspective is what I'm saying. A A Annabelle, yeah. okay, yeah. so listen, mm -hmm. I, I think you're amazing. I mean, you are one of the most, um, put your money where your mouth is, put your boots on the ground where your mouth is and where your heart is. I've never seen anyone, literally, I've never seen anyone, which is how we met in the first place down in Selma, Alabama. I've never seen anyone put themselves so 100% into trying to make the world a better place. And I, I bow to you for that. It's unbelievable, right? And I haven't had those conversations with the tens and hundreds and thousands of people that you have, but I, I, I have to disagree with you. The way we change how things are in this country and in our, your state and in your county and in your city is by, to a large extent, I mean, there are other factors as well, but to a very large extent, it's by electing people who do understand those things and are willing and have the guts and the power to actually put their money where their mouth is and to propose legislation to address rural hospitals, to address mental illness, to address the fact that people are not getting a living wage. For example, there is another piece of legislation raising that the Democrats have passed that will become law, the Raise the Wage Act, right? So instead of getting $7 and whatever an hour, you're going to get $15, right? And it's only Democrats that are doing it. So I don't know, and maybe because I'm this arrogant, elitist, academic lawyer person, but it is through the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, for example, it's through legislation that can make transformational or incremental differences. And it's not gonna, government is not the cure to everything, right? But it can help a lot. And in my experience of 50 years in politics, I've only seen one group of people that really care about the things that you're talking about. And I contend, that if we do elect more people so we can pass these things 
you know, to have equal pay for women and to raise the minimum wage and to have background checks for guns and to have voting rights so that people of color are not consistently and for the till the end of time <clears throat> having their votes suppressed on and on and have LGBTQ people be given same rights and the legal protection of national law. These are not insignificant things, even though right. they are well, things that people don't pay attention to and they don't show up in their daily lives right. like they do show up in mine. Okay, so first of all, thank you, Richard. I am grateful for your kind of acknowledgement or recognition. I'm very flattered. I didn't know that was coming, and that means a lot well, to me true. that you see it. You see that. Um, I think we make a good team, even though we have these disagreements, because you understand the process a lot better than I do, and I bow down to you for that. And I think we can really work together to figure out a strategy that would be very important, vital, I think, to saving this election. Because you and I are probably equally worried about this election. I know too many people who are walking around saying, we're gonna win, we're winning. You know, and I can't, I just, I can't even, easy. I can't, I cannot so, even engage them at the moment. But, so, but here's the thing. <laughs> the only thing I wanna say to you is, we need to um, do this with, in my, and I, again, I'm not telling you what to do. This is how I want to do it. I, <laughs> I just want to do this with a lot of um, love in my heart for people who don't vote, who don't vote regularly, and who voted for Trump, who are still thinking about voting for Trump, because I think we need to reach them in a way that they need to be reached. It can't be done in a way that feels comfortable for us. I think it's important to figure out like how, how do we get them to be receptive to our ideas and to seeing it our way? And that takes time and so it takes patience. And so it might be that one of the differences that you and I have is that maybe I have more patience for those conversations, but. Uh, listen, <clears throat> honestly, <clears throat> I, I applaud your patience. I think these conversations are important. I'm not quite honestly concerned <clears throat> about oh. the people who voted who, about the people who voted for Trump. Okay. I think a very small percentage of people who voted for Trump are going to flip, right? We got the Lincoln Project, we have other organizations mm -hmm. that are focused on that. The biggest thing is to go back to, and I do care. So no, My no, what, no, Richard, you're misunderstanding me. I'm not saying we should talk to Trump people to get them to vote for Biden. But when we talk to them with so much hatred and condescension and contempt, the people in the middle, the swing voters, okay, see us a, as the haters, see us as the bad people. Right. That which is why <clears throat> for the last five years I've been working on and trying to communicate a disruptive model of politics <clears throat> where we don't part focus on political party, we don't focus on political candidates, we focus on pieces of legislation and then hire slash elect the people who are going to get those pieces of legislation turned, you know, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill, the people who are gonna take it from a bill to the law of the land on things that I am deeply passionate about, like gun safety and, and the Equality Act and equal pay for women and voting rights and, and, and the environment. And if we really focus on, and I know it sounds overly academic and it's like, I don't care about people, but if we really focus on the fixes, right, the pieces of legislation and the fact that we are only four people away from accomplishing almost everything that we want, that is where my passion goes. And you're right, I have lost patience having these conversations that you have the incredible patience to have. I just wanna take action and um, communicate as okay. in the way that we can that there is a way forward. There's a fix. So it's a male approach okay. versus a female approach. And so I do think we have mm -hmm. a great combination. Yeah. Okay. So let's do this. Let's reiterate the call to action. Okay. So what 
what do you want people to do? Because I think we're in agreement about that. So that's the important part. That's the, the meat of this conversation. What's the call to action? Okay, so <clears throat> I want people to watch the Republican National Convention this week. And I want them to watch the Democratic Convention if they haven't watched it already. And I want you to tune in with your heart on the vision, the direction, the quality, right? I mean, Joe Biden, in his acceptance speech, talked about love and light. And he was trashed by Donald Trump as having this all be so negative and dirty and horrible and all of that. So I want people to understand the two different visions of America that are represented in this unique way by having four days for one party to sell their story and four days to another, okay? And if you are more attracted to the fear mongering and the vision of America that Donald Trump and the Republicans have, then God bless you, vote for him, right? But I doubt most people would be. I personally believe that Donald Trump is the greatest threat to our democracy since the British in the Revolutionary War. I think he is a modern day Hitler and we have lost almost every single check and balance that we have on the an overpowered executive branch. With a re-election, Donald Trump will have nothing to hold him back, especially if we don't flip the Senate. So I want you to focus on the consequences. I want you to vote no matter who you vote for. I don't want you to vote for mail by mail. And I want you to please, I beg you, if you are not a fan of Joe Biden, to please read, did you put my RBG and 29 other reasons to vote for Joe yes. Biden? Yeah, I want you I to go, go through that list. And if none of those 30 reasons resonate with you, then don't vote or vote for Donald Trump. But this is the biggest, most important election certainly in my lifetime, and I'm older than most of you. And it's critical that we not just vote and vote for Joe Biden, in my opinion, but that we overwhelm the system. So where we are at 65, 70%, because we've engaged those 100 million people who have said, I give up, and we've explained to them and helped them understand that there's only one party, and I said, we don't talk about party, but there's only one group of people who are going to enact the pieces of legislation that will make your lives better. I promise you, I promise you. And, you know, happy to have more conversation about it, but I do okay. think ultimately we can turn this around if people mm -hmm. really engage and they open their heart and they do care about the people that Annabelle was talking about and they vote for people who can make mm -hmm. their lives and all of our lives better and save our democracy in these next four mm -hmm. years and then we can have really important, constructive, valuable conversations about the Green New Deal and Medicare for all and free college for all and really transforming this country the way you and I, Annabelle, would love to see it transformed. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, Richard, I consider you my teacher. I consider you an ally. You know, I... I only thing I would say is I feel like we have to keep talking to each other. <laughs> um, one thing I do want to talk about next, um, let's plan on doing this regularly, if you don't mind, if you can stand it. Um, if, if your fans I, can stand it. Yeah, well, I watched uh, The Walking Dead. I, in fact, I was kind of hooked on The Walking Dead for like the first three seasons or so. Um, and I fear that we're going to have like a Walking Dead, like almost apocalyptic, situation um, in November if Trump does cheat and win um, and that we do have violent standoffs and people decide they're, that the only way they're going to get by is to create these tribes. Like they're, we're call, politely calling them pods during the pandemic. People are getting together in little groups and creating pods, right? And, and I, I just feel, oh my God, do I need to find a pod in order to like survive something that's going to feel really scary in the coming months. So anyway, that, that's for the next time, like where you can play my therapist and help me deal with like with this nightmare scenario, this fear that I have about uh, like America becoming like Belarus right now. Um, America becoming like Charlottesville on a massive scale, Charlottesville everywhere. 
after uh, the election. Anyway, but um, let's not go into it now because so I'm going to need, I, need I a drink for that. There is, okay. there, is a, there, is a, there is a fix for that, right? I oh, would God. say the scenario, the scenario you're talking about is 85% mm -hmm. certain in my opinion, but there is a 15% fix that would be very effective that we can talk about next time. Okay, so next time, promise me you're going to come back. Promise okay. not, not to not to uh, argue with you the half, half the time, because um, no, I did uh, really want to just listen to you mostly. <laughs> mostly, yeah, um, that's the key yeah. point. Listen, I, thank you. I love you. I adore you. Thank you for okay. those of you who stayed with us all this time. And uh -huh. happy to answer any questions. And if you want to attack me for whatever I'm saying, fine. I don't care. I am just dedicated to trying to take you know, whatever it is that I have that might be of value in terms of information and experience and perspective to help teach about the infrastructure of our civics system. And that my guiding words are from this incredible environmentalist, National Geographic explorer, a marine biologist named Sylvia Earle, who is one of my, my heroes. She's like the Jane Goodall of the ocean. And she says that you can't really care until you know mm -hmm. right so it's all for me about knowledge and learning and education and let's let's get as much information as we can and then powered by our heart i think we can make a difference here thank you annabelle thank you Lots richard okay see you later take care bye. bye okay oh boy Okay. Okay. So, um, I, yeah, I just wanted to let you guys know I'm going to just keep doing these conversations with anybody that might have an interesting perspective, uh, voters, experts, friends. Um, I, I'm just interested in having authentic conversations about the state of our country and what we can do about it. And so if you have ideas, just uh, send us a message on Talk on Main Street. You can also find me, Annabelle Park, um, on Facebook. Um, one request is that um, I really, really want you guys <laughs> to check out countmeintowin.org. That's the project I am working on um, with all my heart right now, countmeintowin.org. We created something called the 100 Voters Project where we're trying to create tools for you to help your friends and family vote. And so we're gonna give you information and tools that, can, that will make it easy for you to do that. So come to countmeintowin.org and sign up for um, the 100 Voters Project. And we have organizing meetings Wednesdays and Saturdays. So we have two separate times you can come, learn about it, check in, um, hear what people's experiences are and help us win this election. Because as much as Richard and I were disagreeing on some things, we both agree we've got to win um, and that it is a matter of survival. Um, the only place where I think we disagree is like, how, how do we get more people to vote? How do we get more people to vote for Democrats? And to me, like that means um, trying to understand why a lot of people will check out or don't vote and feel overwhelmed. Um, anyway, but um, yeah, so come come check us out at countmentwin.org. Uh, thank you so much for um, watching and for sharing, for your comments. And I really do feel um, deep down that we're going to save this country by empowering the grassroots, ordinary people in this country. It's not going to happen because we found some saviors, but that millions of us decide to take matters into our own hands and organize, speak up vote, help our friends and family vote, and decide that this country belongs to us and it is up to us to do a major course correction and save our democracy. 
Um, so thank you so much for joining. Um, I will talk to you guys again very soon. You've been listening to Conversations About a Way Forward from Count Me In to Win and The Talk on Main Street. To learn more, find us on Facebook at The Talk on Main Street.